Welcome to Walk in the Spirit, an expository teaching of God's Word with Pastor Brian Griffin. Walk in the Spirit is an outreach ministry of Pocatello Baptist Church. It is our prayer and desire that with the help of this message, we will all learn to walk in the Spirit. So uh, before we begin by reading our text this morning, happy Valentine's Day. I, uh, I won't lie to you, I'm not a big Valentine's Day proponent. Uh, I've never really been one to celebrate Valentine's Day with my bride. Um, and I know some of you might look at me dirty, but uh, that's okay. Um, honestly, I think Valentine's Day was invented so those men who didn't know how to treat their wives would remember to. <laughs> All right? I'm teasing. For those of you who celebrated, I'm just joking with you. Um, but the truth <laughs> of the matter is... <laughs> Some of the guys' shoes got real tight right there real quick, didn't they? Anyway, um, honestly, uh, I don't know how many of you really know much of the history of Valentine's Day. Um, Valentine's Day, uh, St. Valentine, from our Valentino, where we get our uh, Valentine's Day from, uh, we don't know much about. Legend has it, um, a couple of stories about him, but we do know that he was martyred. He's even list listed in, the, in Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, and during the 10th persecution, really, wave of persecution for the church in about A.D. 300, give or take a little bit, um, he was put to death. Uh, why he was put to death, according to legend, is because uh, at that time, Gaius, one of the, uh, the uh, rulers of the time, uh, desired that men should not marry. Uh, he just thought it was okay for them just to have kind of multiple partners and so on and so forth, but he really didn't want young people to marry. In particular, he didn't want young people to marry because he didn't want his soldiers distracted by marriage. He wanted, thought they'd make better soldiers if they, uh, they just weren't uh, married. And... Uh, so he, uh, he prohibited that, and uh, Valentino took it upon himself because they, you know, the church believes in marriage. The Lord brought them together in Genesis, and we consider we should still bring them together. And so Valentino took it upon himself uh, to perform secret marriages or secret weddings, and uh, when it was found out, then he was... Uh, um, actually, there was three course uh, death put to him, um, and so he was uh, martyred that way and for that cause, which is why we consider him the uh, patron saint of love. Now, mind you, that was before the Roman Catholic Church got really involved and kind of distorted things. But the truth of the matter is, is that uh, it doesn't matter. Because in all honesty, the greatest love story ever told and the greatest valentine that you've ever received came in the form of God himself in the flesh and died upon a cross. That was his statement of how much he loved you. And if you would, it reminds me of this morning when we were shaking hands. I was handed a little mint from one of the young people, and on it it said, Be mine. And uh, in all honesty, I can see that is exactly what the Lord was saying on the cross to you. Be mine. Be mine. Now, the sad part of the story of the mint that I received this morning is they picked it up off the ground, and they didn't tell me that until they popped it in my mouth. <laughs> But, right? All right. So anyway, let's begin this morning by taking a look at our text, if you would. John chapter 15, verses 8 through 17. John chapter 15, verses 8 through 17. It says, Herein is my Father, excuse me, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than, 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 that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth, but I called you friends, and for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, and I love this statement, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give us you. These things I command ye, that ye love one another." Let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you, Lord, we thank you and praise you for this day, and we thank you and praise you for the blessings of being here together. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for that greatest of all love stories, Lord, that love that you had for us even before the foundations of the world where you destined us, Lord, predestined us according to your foreknowledge, Lord, to be called your children, and that you would choose to come in the form of your own creation and die upon a cross for us, Lord. 
we cannot understand the greatest amount of love that you have displayed to us, Lord, but help us to, to uh, remember how much you do love us. And we pray right now, Lord, that as uh, we read your word and we study, Lord, that you remove your servant and let your spirit teach now this morning. In your son, Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. So the other day I was uh, speaking with Jaden, and I don't know how for sure we got on the subject, but we got on the subject of love and dating. And Jaden was expressing to me how he didn't really know how to go about dating, about how to ask a young lady out on a date. And uh, rest assured, I began by explaining to my son that uh, he would not be allowed to even consider asking a young lady out on a date until he had taken his mother out on a date, and she had to give her approval that he knew how to treat a young lady. Until that happened, he was not even going to be allowed to date. And so, uh, so hopefully he's making his plans if he really decides he wants to try to start dating. But the truth of the matter is this. As we went on and started uh, talking about it, I explained to Jaden that young people, honestly, most of the young people he sees in his own life right now dating, don't know what dating is either. They think they know what dating is, and I call it, they call it dating, but they don't really understand what dating is about. Because when you are at an age when you're not really looking for a spouse, that dating really just only means that you are like everyone else and can say you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. That's all it's all about. Until you're actually old enough to start exploring the idea of marriage, dating is really, in all honesty, a, a fallacy. Now, I don't want to say that I, I'm upset with our young people who choose to date because at least they're dating each other. I mean, I'll be honest with you. As long as they're dating a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, great. You know, uh, hopefully there's some safety in that and they won't run into and fall into the things that so much of the world does or those who are choosing to be unequally yoked do. But I told him that it was not unlike when I was in the fifth grade. A boy or a girl would pass the note through several young people and uh, they'd finally get to the one that they wanted the note to go to and you'd open it up and you'd read it and someone would ask you, do you like like me? Check yes or no. And so what would you do? You would check yes or no. And if you checked yes, you would send it back. And then usually the note would come back again. And this time, the question was different. The question was, will you be my boyfriend or girlfriend? Again, check yes or no. If you were a young man, you'd you know, obviously usually check yes because you're like, whatever. And uh, so you would check yes. And uh, all of a sudden, you had a girlfriend because you checked yes. And uh, come recess time, she would go out and tell everybody that you're a boyfriend and girlfriend and you would go out and play football. <laughs> In all honesty, that's kind of what I see a lot of the dating happening nowadays amongst young people kind of being like. Why? Because I remember in the fifth grade when I was dating, I was going out, I had a girlfriend or whatever the case may have been in the fifth grade, and mind you, I had many. I was quite the ladies' man. <laughs> all right? But like my, like my brother mentioned to my son the other day, he goes, don't be the ladies' man, be a lady man. But that's a whole other story. But the truth of the matter is, is, is uh, I remember that uh, what would happen was we'd all of a sudden I'd have a girlfriend, and like I said, it didn't really change my life at all. Um, and so I would go out and play football or whatever. We'd see each other in the hallway, and we'd just pass on by, and she would usually giggle, and my buddies would punch me or something, you know, and, and it was like, oh, yeah, you're dating her. Okay, whatever. And honestly, we never talked, did we? I mean, even in class, if we sat next to each other, we'd even talk. We were, here we are, boyfriend and girlfriend, and we're not talking to each other because that's just embarrassing until we got home and we could get on the phone. Now, the phone, that's where all the talking really happened, right? Yes, because I, I, would, I was required to, as a boyfriend, a good boyfriend, to call my girlfriend the minute I got home. So I would call my girlfriend, she would answer, she'd have about 15 friends over, and I would get to listen for about an hour and a half as she talked to them. Sometimes the questions would come back with something like this. Do you know if so-and-so likes so-and-so? Wait, what about us, right? Now, I have to say, after I got done explaining all these things to my son, uh, and I explained to him how, you know, how dating worked back in the fifth grade, my son says to me these words, and I'm not joking when I say this, and I quote. I said, I've got to read this because I want to make sure I get this right. This is what my son said. He says, Man, I got to hand it to those fifth graders. That is brilliant. <laughs> now, point missed. Anyway, 
the truth of the matter was, as I tried to express to Jaden how to, to accomplish all you'd have done if you'd done those kind of things was to accomplish finding someone whom you were attracted to and who was attracted to you, but often, again, you would avoid each other. Uh, my hope was that Jaden would begin to understand that dating was a, a more, had more of a purpose to it, to discover what attributes you would desire in a spouse when you're ready to get married, and that all that could be accomplished without being exclusive. That all that could be done by date, group, date, group, group going, or going out with friends, date, dating in groups. I can't even think of the right word. Pardon, pardon me. But going out together. You don't have to be exclusive and say, I'm going out with so-and-so to figure those things out. Because let's be honest. Unfortunately, even today, there are people who look at other people's spouses and go, I wish my husband was more like. You didn't have to be exclusive to figure those things out, did you? But the truth of the matter is, you got who you got, and you've got to learn how to love them whether they love you or not. That's if you're married. If you're unmarried, take some wisdom from that. Figure out what you really want in a spouse. Now, as I say that, though, I remember that one of the questions that always come from the young ladies, and I expressed this to Jaden as well, is in the, with this word, these, these words, the three, four most hated word, words in a young man's life. Do you love me? And a young boy would mind, honestly, it was like saying, like my mom? No, I think you're cute. I mean, that's not honestly what you kind of thought, right? You didn't think about love. You didn't understand what love was all about. You can even begin to fathom the concept of love. You thought you knew what love was, and perhaps you'd even been one of those experienced children who had HBO in their home, and you thought you knew what love was too. But that's not what love is. This morning, I want to spend some time in our text, and I want to try to understand some of the attributes of love. We're not going to cover all the attributes of love this morning, but I do want to say this one thing to begin with. First John tells us that God is love. So understanding that concept to begin with, I want you to understand something, and I'm not trying to be rude when I say this. If they don't know God, they don't and cannot know love. And that is the truth. I'm not saying that there isn't some semblance of, of affection and, and caring and things like that, but to understand the depths of love and what love really is all about, you cannot get that outside of God. So, in our text this morning, twice the Lord tells us in this command that we are to love one another. But what does that really look like? Well, look at our text. When he tells us we are to love one another, let's just put it the first time, right? And he says this in verse 12. He says, This commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. And then he goes on to tell us what love is. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But reread prior to those verses in verse 11 why it's so important for us to understand what love is. Because in verse 11 it says these things, Have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Love, true love, brings joy. It brings joy. And by the way, that does not mean it doesn't bring trials. We could turn over to James, which we've already studied, studied and understand that joy has nothing to do with trials, does it? Well, that's not true. It has to do with trials, but what I mean is it doesn't mean you're not going to have trials. It can be difficult. Marriage can be difficult. Relationships can be difficult. But true joy and true love is really wrapped up and summed up in the, the greatest of verses in this passage, in verse 13, when he says, Then a man lay down his life for his friends. So I want to be honest. Let's be honest. Isn't that what we all want out of love? Is joy? Isn't that why we get fall in love? Is because that person brings joy to our life? Isn't that what we desire? Well, the truth of the matter is that is exactly what it should bring. But it doesn't mean it's not going to bring the heartaches and the hardships. But I want to examine an attribute or two attributes in particular of love this morning and the two phrases that are used in verse 13 in particular. And they come from two words. The first word is laid down. And I know you're thinking to yourself, that's two words. No, that's one word in the Greek. Laid down. And the second one is life. Laid down and life is love. That's what we're going to discover this morning. Laid down the one word in the Greek, one word, word, one word in the Greek carries with it the same connotation of this phrasing where we find used in the Gospels, which is to put under. You remember, right? You know, one lights a candle and puts it under a bushel. It's the same word used. So, in other words, laying down means to put yourself under. That's what laying down your life means. Now, does that mean that, 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 you, that maybe if you have to die for this person, that you should do so? Absolutely. You know, if the Lord calls you to go and die for somebody, you should do so. 
I remember having a conversation with a young man around here one time, and he was talking about protecting people and, and uh, things of this nature. And uh, he asked me, well, would you, would you be willing to, to defend people in this church? I mean, would you shoot somebody who came in here threatening people or, or whatever the case may be? And I remember I said to him, I would, but not because of me. And he looked at me, and he just was perplexed on his line. I'm not, I said, I'm not doing it to defend my life. I'm doing it to defend the lives of everybody else in here. Because the truth of the matter is, I consider if somebody comes in here and threatens us that way, they've made a choice about what they like, what they want from their life. And they're totally accepted the idea that if they were to receive death and that meant hell, then they would be okay with that. But the truth of the matter is that I don't know the eternal state of everybody sitting in this room. And I want to protect that opportunity for them. Now, <clears throat> laying down our life, laying down our life. Here's the point of laying, laying down your life or putting yourself under. And I'm going to just phrase this and then we're going to take a look at some passages to back this up. It means that when we go into a relationship, we shouldn't be seeking what they will give to us, but what we can give to them. That is a true and right love relationship. Unfortunately, the world has got that all messed up nowadays, don't they? Because they think that if I'm in love, it means it should bring something to me. That person should add to me. Now, I'm not going to say that they won't. But you shouldn't go into a relationship, and I'm going to give you this much, you shouldn't go into any relationship with the idea of what you can get out of it, rather what you can put into it. And that's really, in all honesty, love. I mean, let's think about that for a second and just use our, our Savior as an example before we look at some passages. When our Savior decided to come and die upon the cross, what was he getting out of it? I mean, in all honesty, he was getting beaten, chastised, you know, I mean, all those things. The only thing he was receiving was what? Something for you. What's his life eternal? That's what he was receiving. Something that benefited us. Now, does that mean that he didn't love us? Or, no, of course he loved us. That's why he was willing to do that. So we don't go into our relationships with that idea. It's about being under, putting ourselves under. In other words, allowing ourselves to become those who would lay down our lives for the other. Turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. You'll remember this is a familiar story for ourselves. Uh, we, ha we run into now the apostles having a great discussion, and one that I don't think is necessarily one different than what sometimes people have today. Luke chapter 22, verses 24 through 27. He says these words to us. He says, And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he said unto them, The king of the Gentiles, the king of the Gentiles exercised lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But ye shall not be so. But that he that is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is the chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater that he sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. So the first thing we see here in this idea of serving, that's putting ourselves under again, isn't it? If you love someone, you will serve them. You will take care of them and their needs and not be concerned with your own. And I'm going to be upfront and honest with you. There are far too many relationships and far too many marriages nowadays that, they, that, that somebody gets upset with or they get, dis they get disgusted by the fact that they're not even getting enough out of this marriage. They're not getting enough out of this person. Well, that means that their heart was wrong and they understand that what the Lord Jesus Christ says love is about to begin with. It's not about what you get out of it. It's about what you put into it. And by the way, the more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. I guarantee you. I absolutely guarantee you that. And I, I promise you that. Try it. I, I challenge anybody in here who's having a difficult time right now to try it. Put more into it and see what comes back out of it. But the problem is that we put in, we put in, we put in, we put in. We're like, shouldn't I be receiving the benefits by now? No. Keep putting. And when you feel like you can't put any more, put some more into it. And when you're done putting up, uh, when, you're done, when you start to see those things come back, you understand what the benefit of it is. And that's how a relationship really works, isn't it? Because the more I put in for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the more I get back out of it. I mean, we could talk about the fruits to begin with. But even aside from that, I'm going to be honest with you, I can, I can serve the Lord all day long and rarely tire. But the minute I put my focus upon myself, 
I wear out like that. The minute I'm like, but Lord, look at all I'm doing for you. Isn't this enough? I get to wore out and I get tired. It's not about what I'm going to get back out of it. You want to be one who actually expresses love to people? You'll be somebody who continues to serve, not expecting back out. But it will come, I promise you. Let's look at another passage similar to this one. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 3, 23, verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 20, 23, verses 1 through 12. The Lord Jesus gives us this idea here. It says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude, verses 1 through 12 of 23, Then spake Jesus to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid, you observe. That observe and do. But do not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay, uh, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one finger. But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be ye not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is your father in heaven. Neither be ye called master, for one is your master, even Christ. Be he be he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he, shall, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. This is the Lord instructing us now. And notice some of the things he mentions in there. He mentions, one, we have to be the greatest among us. To be the greatest among us, we have to be the greatest servant, don't we? Two, if we want to be exalted, we humble ourselves. We humble ourselves. But there's some other instructions in there as well. We see clearly in these passages that we should have a heart that will allow me to love and put myself under others as servants, not desiring that I should be exalted, but rather that I should exalt others through love. I remember observing one time as a young Christian, a man walking into church several paces in front of his wife, and with all the arrogance of a rooster, I don't know if you guys ever watched a rooster walk around his hens, but you know, he walked around head up in the air and just proud, and he had his Bible in his arm, and he was going to church. And I'm not faulting the man for that. But I remember observing as I watched this man that literally, and I, I would say at least 10 paces, if not more, behind him came his wife in tow with all the bags and all the children and everything like that. You know, this man's walking in there like, I am something. And yet he's leaving the one that he was given charge over, actually all those he was given charge over in the dust. Exalting himself, not humbling himself. He was something to be revered. He was something that people should pay attention to. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I know one of the reasons that most people like me is because of my wife. So I will never exalt myself up above her because I know, <laughs> thank you, Jill, because I know that in all honesty, my wife is my helpmate and she makes my ministry what it is. So I would never venture to do that. But isn't this sometimes the attitude we see in the scribes and the Pharisees wanted here? They, what it says, they, they put heavy burdens upon people and they put it upon their shoulders. And I want to warn us in case we become a scribe or a Pharisee. Are you putting burdens upon people's shoulders that aren't theirs to carry? Are you putting demands on them that they shouldn't, that you, that you can go, well, look at them, you're righteous enough to be like that. No, here's the point. This is, what the, this is what the scribes and the Pharisees would do. They would put burdens upon people like it was theirs to carry, the same way that man put all the burdens of the children in all the bags and everything like that upon his wife and exalted himself. I am something. Didn't care about carrying the diaper bags or anything like that. Didn't want to change the diapers. Why? Because I am the man. All sorts of heavy burdens upon the people, but we're not so much as willing to lift the finger to those burdens ourselves, are we? You need to be this way, but don't worry about mine. You suffer. You suffer, it says in verse 13. But one to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up, I mean, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For neither go you yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are in, in, entering to go in. Here's the problem. Sometimes in our, in, our, in, in our idea of serving people, we actually shut up the kingdom of heaven because we put burdens upon them that we, that we won't even carry. We put things upon them that we won't even ourselves lift a finger towards. Now, I, don't know, I know we don't do this in the church anymore. But before I pass this point, I want to give you this idea. 
There are things that the Lord has made a burden unto me that are not your burden. There are things that the Lord has made a liberty unto me that are not your liberties. Likewise, there are things that are your liberties that I don't get to have liberty in. There are things that are your burden that I don't get to have a burden of. And you shouldn't be putting them upon me. Allow the Lord to conform me to his image. Don't you try to force me into that. That's exactly what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing. By all means, challenge me. But don't sit there and make me feel like I'm a lesser being. Because in all honesty, you're not showing me love. And I'll be honest with you. And I don't know if I've ever shared this story with you or not. But shortly after Mike and I got saved, we were very zealous for the Lord. And, and rightly so, do not get me wrong. And we were out there sharing the gospel all the time. We ran into two twins. And uh, we shared the gospel with both of them. And uh, it was interesting because the one kind of immediately seemed like she was receiving what we were saying. So we showed her a lot of love and grace. And we were just kind of kind to her as we were sharing things with her. But the other one kind of put up her hands and resisted some. So we began to berate her and beat her down about everything that she believed that was wrong. And I'm going to be honest with you. There, of those two, one came to know the Lord. One came to know the Lord. The other one won't listen to us to this day. And I don't blame her. Honestly, I don't blame her. I don't have a foot to stand on with her. Because all I did was made her feel bad about her life instead of exalting her and challenging her to, to grow more in the Lord and showing the love of Jesus Christ. I was showing her the wrath of God. And the problem was, that in doing that, honestly, she closed her ears to us. And she would never hear us again. She would never hear us again and she never will hear us again. Well, I shouldn't say that. The Lord can do a work. But the truth of the matter is, is you might find yourself going, well, yeah, I've got to say this, and I've got to say it like this, and you come across and you put this burden upon people, and now all you've done is shut their ears, and they will never listen to you again. You will never gain ground again in their lives. No, rather we are to love them, be an example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can you imagine if the Lord Jesus Christ came at us the way that sometimes people come to our doors? I mean, in all honesty, whew. if the Lord Jesus Christ would have came after me the way I've watched some men who go, not saying door knocking's bad, but the way some men perform their door knocking, I wouldn't be a believer today. I'd have been like, no, thank you. No, you know what he came at me with? Love. He came out with me a love. I'm sorry, I'm getting off track a little bit, though. We understand that if we are to love as the Lord, we are to put ourselves under. And who are we supposed to put ourselves under, by the way? Well, that's a great question, isn't it? We're supposed to put ourselves under everyone. You are to esteem and exalt others better than yourselves. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. But let's turn over to Philippians chapter 2 real quick, if you would. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. You guys are like, what kind of Valentine message? This doesn't sound very fun. I promise it's going to get better in a minute. Your shoes are going to get even tighter. All right. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if there be any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Look not every man unto his own things, but every man also unto the things of others. Did you catch that? Esteem others better than yourselves. Think about others first. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, I want to pause there for a second. Have you ever stopped to think about that statement? Those of you who want to puff yourselves up as something mighty, God himself humbled himself and came in the form of a man. But he also thought it not robbery to be equal with him. And then he goes on from this place and he says, Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess. All right. I'm sorry, that to me, every knee should bow, every tongue confess of the things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. So you understand where Jesus gets exalted by his Father through his humility. Did you see that in there? 
You want to be exalted? You want to be something mighty in the kingdom? You're going to be somebody who serves. If there be any love, let you esteem others better than yourself, which really begins to bring me to my next point. So go ahead and turn back to our text this morning now. I told you we're going to look at the two words. The first one is to lay down. So if you want to be someone who loves, you will serve. You will put yourself under. You won't lift yourself up, and you won't expect others to serve you. I see some of you shedding coats. I'm glad it's not just me that's dying in here. So, All right. This is a great idea, and where, but where's the practical application how we can esteem others and think of others, think others first? In other words, how do I lay down my life? Well, are you ready for this? I'm going to tell you what the Lord showed me. And what I'm about to share with you, I'm going to be honest with you, made me re-examine every relationship I have in my life. Every relationship I have in my life and whether or not I love them. John chapter 15, verse 13 again. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life. His life. Put under his life. Well, so the Lord is saying here that we need to die for them, if need be, yes. But the answer is a little easier than that to swallow this morning than that thought. I told you I wanted to focus on, on two words. The first we've already examined, which is that we would just say we're going to put ourselves under, we're going to esteem others better than ourselves, but the second word is life. So what is your life? It's a great question, isn't it? What is life? Well, we get all medical this morning, we say, well, that's when the hip bone is connected to the transmission, right? Okay, some of you caught that, good. Some of you aren't mechanical in any way, shape, or form, and that's all right, too. The hip bone is not connected to the transmission, and if it is, you're dead, all right? But the truth of the matter is, that's not what life is. And I'm, I'm joking, of course, but we understand that, that, that to not breathe, to not eat, to not drink uh, is, is death. We get that, don't we? Uh, but not thinking, by the way. Don't think that not thinking means you're dead, because I've been on Facebook and the internet, and there's a lot of not thinking happening out there, and there's still forms of life, apparently. But the truth of the matter is, is that we understand the simple things of those things. If I don't eat, I don't drink, I don't breathe, I'm, die I'm dead. But what I want to say this morning for us, if you would, about our life, is I want to be one that would lay down my life. And that's really what I want to focus on this morning. I want to be one that we be willing to say, I will lay down my life for my friends. I lay down my life for my wife, my son, my family, my brothers and sisters in Christ, even my enemies, because that's what the Lord told me to do. And of course, I want to lay down my life for my God, Savior, Lord, Master, Father, and salvation, Jesus Christ. So how do I do that? Well, we find the answer in the text that we recently have gone through in the book of James. Turn with me to James chapter 4 now. James chapter 4. And look at verses 13 and 14 with me, a few from James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. What is your life? Here we go. He says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know what, not, what, not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? Here's the question, and we're going to get the answer. What is your life? What is life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, then vanishes away. You want to know what your life can be summed up in one word? Time. Time. I don't know how much time I have, but I know that I have a certain amount. Our life... I hope you saw it there, is time. And I understand that you may be willing to give your, some time to your wife and kids and give of your life to, you know, to your life and wife and kids to give their necessities and perhaps some of the luxuries of this life, but are you willing to give them your time? Maybe you're willing to spend your money and buy the fanciest TVs or the latest gaming system or, or whatever the case. Maybe you're taking, you know, pay for them to go to the movies or whatever, but are you willing to give them your time? Because in all honesty, that is laying down your life. Are you giving your time? Let me rephrase it to you. Aside from, 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 for, aside from that time that we're required to work for a living, what do you do with your free time? Think about that one for a second. Because I can tell you that if you were to come examine a person's life and you saw what they did with their free time, that is what they love. That is what they really care about. 
If a man gets home from work and ignores his wife and children, I have a hard time believing he loves his wife and children. If I am your friend and you get off and I invite you to do something and you're like, but the game's on. I have a hard time believing you love me. Come watch the game with me. At least we're spending time together. I mean, in all honesty, I mean, what are you giving your time to? What is important to you? Because in all honesty, that is love. Now, if all you do is focus on yourself, we know where your love is, don't we? Well, I'm tired. And I understand we do get tired. We do get wore out. But the truth of the matter is, are you giving your time to the things that really matter in this life? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some things with us real quickly here about this idea of time. Have you ever heard that saying that they're so heavenly minded they're no earthly good? You ever heard anybody say that before? On the surface, I want to be upfront. On the surface, in the way that it is used, that statement is completely wrong. Because if I was that heavenly minded, I would be the most earthly good. But in the depths of the regions of that statement, there is a little nugget of truth. And what I mean by that, and I want to be careful on how I explain this to you, but there is a nugget of truth down there. Um, it, it ha- something I had to learn when I was about being in the ministry. And by the way, you're all in the ministry in case you're curious. But if I am not careful, I will give all my time away serving the Lord. And you're thinking, well, is that bad? Well, it is when I'm so f- focused on serving that I forget who I'm serving. That I forget the one I'm serving. Because I'm going to be honest with you, one of the, sometimes one of the greatest ways that I can serve my Lord and Savior is to take care of my family and spend time with them. To take care of my friends. To take care of my neighbors. I mean, there's a reason why he said first to Jerusalem and then to the world. If you're not giving your time to those things that you do have some control over and you're giving it all away to something else, you're not any good. Because honestly, I'll be honest with you, one of my greatest fears from when we had a child was this, and I will tell you honestly, Chandra and I prayed, both of us together, literally prayed, Lord, if we're going to have this child, and this child has any chance of growing up and not serving you, take him from us or her from us, whatever it was at that point. We don't want the child. But then, you know, a stark reality came to me through that thought. Whose responsibility is it? Well, to a certain extent, it's mine, isn't it? It's what I do with my children that's going to help them to love the Lord and serve the Lord. But I'll be honest with you, my son would hate, absolutely hate me being the pastor of a church if it meant my son never got time with me. If he, and, and we do, we, we, do we, got, we, call them, we call them family days. We give my son basically kind of, not real tokens, but we just tell him, hey, you know, you have so many, things, so many family days. You get to choose. You give us a date, and we will not assign anything, we will not do anything, we will not commit to anything on that day, and that is your day. We will do what you want to do, within reason, obviously. This is your day. This is our family day. And I rarely... I mean, occasionally, you know, things happen, tragedies happen, stuff like that. But rarely will I allow anything to enter into my family day. Sometimes our family day, honestly, I won't lie to you, is just sitting at home on the couches and sleeping. (laughs) All right? Jane's like, I just don't want to go anywhere today. That's a family day. All right, sounds good to us. I thank God I'm raising a child who's as lazy as I am. (laughs) I'm teasing. I'm joking. He's, all right. But the truth of the matter is, 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 would you really think I love my child and my wife if they never got my time? It would be hard to really believe that, wouldn't it? It would be hard for you, even in this congregation, to believe I loved you if you never got my time. I mean, you may not get time with me every week, or we may not get to hang out and have dinner all the time, but you know, how about just when we get to have a conversation with me? I stand around you, we talk. You know, can you imagine instead of standing at the back of the, uh, of the, the, one of the reasons why I stand at the back of the foyer at the end of the service here is because I want to have time with you. I want to at least give you a hug and tell you I love you. I want some time with you. I want you to know that I care. And that's the truth. But you would have a hard time believing that if all I did was marched out of this room, went up into my office, closed the door, and nobody would disturb me. I am the pastor. I should try that. Anyway, <laughs> speaking of lazy. Anyway, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 real quick, if you would. Ephesians chapter 5. I want to take a, some more instructions about this idea of our time and what we're spending our time on. And I want to take it from some of the instructions the Lord gives us about our lives. 
Ephesians chapter 5, and just to throw this in because I want to throw it in, start at verses 1 and 2 with me. We're going to look down at some different passages here in a minute. But starting at verses 1 and 2 of Ephesians chapter 5, the apostle writing says these words to us. He says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Savor, sorry, and Savior. But, okay, but the truth of the matter is, guys, is, do you see right there, just starting right there, how he, we're going to talk about love, aren't we? We're going to walk in love. And how do, we, how do we walk in love? Well, let's just start with that famous of all passages because we want to go there, because we all love it. Turn down to, or look down to verse 24 of that same chapter. It says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to me, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, I want to really see here, I hope you see, that what it's saying there, if you love each other, you're going to do what? You're going to give your time and service to each other. That's what it's telling you you're going to do. And by the way, did you notice in there that never did the Apostle Paul say, Husbands, if your wives don't love you, don't worry about loving them. Wives, if your husbands, if you, excuse me, husbands, if your wives don't servant you or reverence you, don't worry about loving them. Or likewise, wives, if your husbands don't love you the way you think you should be loved, you don't have to do it anymore either. No, he never says those words to us. But he says there, if we love our spouse, we're going to do what? We're going to give them our time. We're going to serve them. And one of the ways we're going to serve our wife is by helping to her grow in the Lord helping her to grow in the Lord. All right, men. How many of you spend time in the Word of God with your spouse? All right, women. How many of you ask your husbands to spend time with you in the Word of God? Or how many of you, when they have that free moment, think to yourself, I want to watch fill in the blank. Yeah, I know the Word of God's there but I want this instead. I mean, honestly, what is important? And by the way, I want you guys to understand, my shoes are just as pinching right now as yours are, okay? None of us are perfect in this. But what do you really do? Are you so, and how about this? What kind of husband would I be if all I do is, I mean, I'm not being rude when I say this, but if all I did was sit there and spend time in the Word of God for myself but never shared it with my family? Never sat down with my family and shared it. Am I doing what the Lord has instructed me to do? No. But I'll feel self-righteous. Why? Because all I look at is the Word of God. But I'm never feeding my family. And then he goes on from that point, and he, just in case the kids want to be left out, we're not going to let them be. Look at chapter 6, verses 1 through, one through 4. It says, children, obey. We're going to stop right there. I'm just kidding you. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And we remember the promise was what? You're going to honor your mother and father so they don't knock you out. I'm paraphrasing there. That's, that's like the message Bible. Chapter th or verse 3. That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And, uh, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I can't bring my son up in the Lord, in the nurture and the admiration of the Lord, without spending time with him. I can't do it. I can't. It's impossible. Children, by the way, that doesn't give you an excuse to look at your father or your mother and go, you need to be spending time with me in the Lord. Because I'm willing to bet when you have free time, you're not thinking about spending time with your parents. I want to play that game. I want to get on that video game. I want to go hang out with so-and-so. You know, the Lord designed us as a family for a reason, guys. 
And not only does our family, I mean, obviously we have our nuclear families in our households, but you know, then the family goes to the family of God. But if this one, I mean, if my, if the, isn't that what so many diseases are? Something within on the depths of the cells is wrong, and so then the whole thing becomes bad, doesn't it? If my cell of my family isn't correct, I can't be of any benefit to you guys. And that's the truth. So we see now that we should show our love by giving our time to our children as well. We can read further on in this passage, and I'm not going to in the interest of time, but we can see how the, our love is displayed through our time towards those that have charge over us. What does that mean? Those who are our bosses. Those who we have charge over. Those we are our bosses over. Our enemies. And of course, we must prepare for them. But before we leave this passage, I want to look at another one, if you'll back up some with me a little bit, um, to really kind of set things in a perfect order here, if you would. Look at verse 15. He says these words to us, verse 15 through 21. He says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Do you see where he's going to talk to us about what our time and what's important about our time? And then he goes on to talk to us about what? First himself. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for the things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, pausing there for a second. So the first order we see of redeeming our time, of showing our love, is to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we go into what? Submitting yourselves, wives, unto your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. And we go into the kids. Then we go into the others. So on and so forth. Do you see that? I could be spending all my days, all long, serving the Lord, and I'm doing the first step. But there's more steps to that process. Or I could be spending my days all long serving you and never taking care of my own family. I could be serving, spending my days redeeming my time by being out and just sharing the gospel with every unbeliever but never touching you guys. That would not do any of us any good. There's an order and it's specific. And it's about redeeming the time. And what you love is what you will put your time into. I remember that uh, when we were down in um, Legoland down in San Diego with my nephew, it was shortly after Hurricane Katrina. And they have down there in Legoland, they have um, where they rebuild cities to scale of whatever a Lego scale is. Anyway, they were pretty immaculate. I won't say, I mean, I was never that intricate with building with Legos. I mean, I was able to build a gun until I picked it up, you know. And, uh, and so, and every once in a while, I could actually make a brick tower. But the truth of the matter was, is in all honesty, that these people, they build these amazing, amazing things. And I remember my, my nephew asked an amazing question after Hurricane Katrina. Now, understand, my nephew ha has autism. And uh, so we're down there, and we're looking at these things. And after we're done going through the tour, the guy's like, do you, any of you have any questions? And my nephew, Jeremy, he raises his hand up. And I won't lie to you, myself, Eli, Chandra, Harmony, all of us kind of, <gasps> what's he going to ask? And he says, well, I'm just curious. We saw New Orleans right over there. He's like, yeah? He goes, why didn't you guys destroy it and put it underwater? I thought it was a great question. <laughs> but, you know, the guy stopped and it took his breath away from it. He goes, well, because well, there was a lot of time put into those things. And it would be really sad to destroy them like that. Uh, somebody took a lot of their time and effort and built those things. And why did they take their time and their effort and build those things? Because that's what they love to do. What do you take your time and your effort and build? Because that's what you love. That's what you love. Now, to where the Lord teaches us about using our time and to show his love and how important it is to him. Turn to me in Matthew 25, and this will be the last place we look at this morning, guys. Matthew 25. Picking it up at verse 31 through 46. says, when the Son of Man, this is Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, and shall he, and he, and shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep, I'm not, am I in the right chapter? Yeah, I am. And set his sheep upon 
there we go, excuse me, and set his sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When we saw thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall ye also say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devils and his angels. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then they shall also answer him, saying, Lord, when we saw thee a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee. Then shall he answer unto them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not. To one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. All these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into, etern into life eternal. Do you see how the Lord tells us there that if we truly love him, we will serve, and that we will serve with our time? I cannot take care of people, be it strangers or my own family, without giving them time. We have to understand, and I want you to understand something here. Remember we started out in Matthew, go ahead and turn back to our main text, in Matthew chapter 15. And you remember what he said to us now, if you would. Pick it up in uh, verse 8. He says, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Now I want you to jump down, if you would. Um, as it goes on, let's see, join me for, sorry. Uh, oh, verse 16. And ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You know, there's only one fruit any one of us can produce from our lives that will remain forever. Only one fruit in our lives that we can produce that will remain forever. There's only one thing in this entire world, aside from the Word of God, which is already there, that will remain forever. And that is people. If you love Him, you will keep His commands. And if you love one another, you will serve and give your time. I hope that each one of us this morning is going and saying to ourselves, I do love people. But remember I told you that I had to re-examine every relationship in my life this week. And I had to ask myself, do I really love that person? Well, I don't know. Am I giving any time to that person? Because if I say I love somebody and don't, I'm a liar. If they're not good enough for any of my time, I'm a liar. What you really love is what you spend your time in. Thank you for studying God's Word with us on Walk in the Spirit. To hear more of this or other portions of Scripture, please visit www.pocatellobaptistchurch.com or you can write us at 190 West Chapel Road, Pocatello, Idaho, 83201. If you live in or are visiting Southeast Idaho, we would like to have you join us here at Pocatello Baptist Church for any of our services. Our service times begin with Sunday school at 9 a.m., Sunday worship at 10 a.m., and Sunday evening study at 5 p.m. We have a midweek study and prayer service for both adults and youth on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Child care is available for all of our services. For more information or directions, please call us at 208-237-4915. Until next time, God bless you as you walk in the Spirit.